founding member of the Archaeological Institute of America. <laughs> so, now, um, in the second half, considered 
to build here his new capital before he decided to do that at Constantinople. Thus, from the Middle Ages on, also European travelers looked for Troy at different sites in the northwest of Asia Minor. In 1822, the Scottish scholar Charles McLaren suggested that the hill of Hissarlik, the site of Ilion Norum, was also the site of Homeric Troy. It was only 40 years later that the English expatriate, consular official, and amateur archaeologist, Frank Calvert, whom you see on the right, started excavation on his Arabic. He did not have the mean, means necessary to continue with the excavations and left his Arabic to Heinrich Schliemann, who started his excavation in 1871. Schliemann hoped, as recounted in his auto autobiography, I quote, to produce evidence to the civilized world that old Greek legend about the ten-year-long war of Troy was true and that Homer had portrayed the royal city citadel of Priam in a sincere and accurate fashion. Being convinced that the Homeric Troy must lie on the natural ground, he ordered for the opening of a deep ditch through the hill from north to south. In this process, the remains of the sanctuary of Athena, established by the Simachos, on the right you see a meteau showing the sun of Helios from the sanctuary, as well as strata of older occupation phases were mercilessly removed. At a depth of 33 feet, the dig brought to light a strong fortification wall, a strong fortification wall, which you see here, with a ramp leading up to it. For Schliemann, there was no doubt this was the citadel of Priam, while the ramp led over to the Scaean Gate in the foreground. And here you see views of the wall and ramp as they appear nowadays. The burnt buildings behind the gate belonged, according to Schliemann, to Priam's palace. An astonishing discovery provided Schliemann with a further confirmation for this theory. <coughs> Next to the ramp at the fortification wall about here, he came upon across a hoard consisting of golden cups weighing several pounds, large silver jacks, golden diadems, <coughs> bracelets, necklaces, and diadems made of thousands of tiny gold plates stitched together. For Schliemann, these could only have been the ostentatious processions of a powerful ruler of the land, Priam's treasure. And to the right, you see Schliemann's Greek wife, Sophia, wearing the so-called Helen's jewelry. In his last campaign at Troy, in 1890, the same year that he died, Schliemann was, however, forced to acknowledge that he had been mistaken. Along with his assistant, Wilhelm Dirkfeld, they came across a new and thin wall in red on the plan. This, of, uh, this wall here, and here in the model, <coughs> about 40 meters in front of the fortification wall, considered first as the one belonging to Homeric Troy. This one here. Finds from the associated layers included Mycenaean pottery of the 14th to 13th centuries BC, similar to that he had been previously discovered uh, himself, Schliemann, at Mycenae, to which I will come back later. Troy II, which is placed today in the early Bronze Age, 3rd millennium BC, proved therefore to be much too early to have been the backdrop to the Trojan War. Later, Dirkfeld recounted the manner in which Schliemann reacted upon realizing this error. When he explained the problem to Schliemann, the latter listened, listened carefully but hardly said anything. Then he retired to his tent and did not talk to anybody for four days. But when he came out again, he simply said to Dirkfeld, I think you are right. <laughs> Schliemann's heirs at Troy, Wilhelm Dörfeld left Karl Legen in the center, and Manfred Korkman, right, have
have demonstrated by means of their excavations that Troy 6 to 7a in the 13th to the beginning of the 12th century, uh, 12th century BC, the time of the Trojan War, according to the Greek historical tradition, was an important royal seat with a citadel <coughs> for the ruling class and a fortified lower city. The plan on the left shows the areas excavated by the team under the direction of the late Manfred Hoffmann at the lower city of Troy, city to 7a, uh, which had been disturbed by the establishment of Ilium Novum. At the upper right corner, there is a chart showing the distribution of Rome's age pottery pounds. And uh, whereas uh, below, you see, on right, you see an artist's impression of Troy 6 with the citadel in the foreground. And how is the citadel here in the foreground, and here the lower city. Here the citadel and the lower city. Systematic investigations of the site's hinterland by Gorkman's team have shown that Troy 6 to 7a constituted during the same period a central place for the entire region, uh, region of the Troas. But let us once more return to Schliemann. Hardly having completely, uh, completed works for the first time at Isaldic in 1873, and inspired by his discovery of what he thought was Priam's residence, he felt the need to uncover the seat of Troy's fiercest enemy, Agamemnon, the much praised by whom Homer, Mycenae, rich in gold. Unlike Troy, however, Mycenae did not have to be located first. The strongly fortified citadel with the so-called Cyclopean walls, constructed with large blocks, traditionally attributed to the Cyclopes, a mythic race of giants, hence the name, as well as the lions on the famous relief above the main gate, had always been visible. With Homer in the one hand and Pausanias, the second century AD, travel writer in the other, Schliemann began to dig a few meters within the citadel walls, behind the famous Lion Gate. And the Mycenaean world could not have come to life in a more dramatic fashion than it did through the discoveries of that excavation. Pausanias had stated that the graves of Agamemnon and his family members lay within the walls of Mycenae. Schliemann came across five charred graves in Grave Circle A in which 15 individuals in total had been buried. And on the basis of the astonishingly <coughs> rich finds, there was little doubt for Schliemann that this was the final resting place of Agamemnon and his family. The faces of males were covered by golden masks, while gold plates with rich spiral decoration had been placed on their chests. The Female individuals were decorated with golden discs on their dresses, as well as carrying diadems, earrings, and bracelets. As a gift for the afterlife, the rulers had been given in the grave costly ointments and oil in bronze and silver flame, but also their drinking equipment, as well as their swords with gold plated scabbards, all richly decorated. Representations of combat scenes in relief on the gold signet ring and also the, some silver vessels, here the silver right on depicting the siege of the city, reminded Schliemann of similar scenes recounted in the Iliad. While the defensive weapons <coughs> used in these scenes and some of the, those discovered as great goods were also taken to fit the description provided by the Homeric text. Good examples are the large shields covering the entire body from jaw to feet, here and here, that were carried over the shoulder by means of a leather strap, the so-called telamon, which you can see here, which is also uh, described by Homer. Here depicted on the, the gold ring, already shown before, on the left and the dagger with the gold inlaid seen from the lion, uh, lion hunt, as well as also the helmet of Mariones made of boar's tasks, as recounted in the 10th book, and I quote. And on his head, he set a leather helmet that was lined with a strong plating of leather thongs, while on the outside, it was thickly studded with boar's teeth, well and skillfully set into it. And next, the head, there was an inner lining of felt. The picture left shows the reconstruction of such a helmet with the boss cast soon onto leather straps attached to the helmet cap. And on the right, you see uh, the depiction of a similar helmet on an ivory lily from Mycenae. 
men had brought with him from home, studded with bosses of gold, and had four handles on each of which there were two golden doves feeding, and it had two feet to stand it on. As Schliemann believed to observe that certain of the deceased individuals had been buried in obvious haste in a manner fitting to the careless funeral provided by Clytemnestra for her murdered husband, there existed no more doubt for him that the graves he had discovered were actually those of Agamemnon and his companion. He even went so far to communicate this in a telegram to the king of Greece. But here Schliemann was again mistaken, for we know now that the sharp graves of Mycenae belong to the very beginning of the Mycenaean period and therefore are several centuries older than the traditional date of the Trojan War. Schliemann's discoveries sparked a spate of excavations on sites of the late Bronze Age civilization on the Greek mainland, which came to be named Mycenaean after the first and most important find spot. By the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, these investigations had already shown that the Mycenaean civilization encompassed the Greek mainland from Mycenae in the south to Thessaly in the north. In addition, it was now possibly, possibly possible to attribute discoveries that had been made earlier to the Mycenaean period, as in the case of Yanisov here on Rhodes, where a chamber, cemetery of chamber tombs on these two hills had been excavated as early as 1868, and the finds had been transported to the British Museum in London. On the right, you see a small selection of these. The correct classification of these finds now demonstrated that the Mycenaean civilization in the 4th and 13th centuries BC stretched out over the Aegean to Rhodes. Similarly, excavations at Miletus here that started in 1899 by the Berlin Museums showed that the Mycenaeans had also set foot here. In the area of the later Temple of Athena, excavations uncovered the remains of a late Bronze Age settlement with Mycenaean pottery, while on the Diamantepe Hill, which is here, here's the area of the Temple of Athena, and here you see the wall. Um, of approximately one mile to the southwest of the Temple of Athena, 11 Mycenaean chamber tombs with typical Mycenaean grave goods were discovered. Here are some examples of the pottery and also of the jewelry. This suggested that the area had indeed been settled by Mycenaean Greece. Contrary to Troy, where Mycenaean pottery constituted only a very limited part of the ceramic assemblage, which was made up predominantly of greyware, as these examples here. In Greece, some of the most important excavations of the turn of the century on Bronze Age sites were led by the Greek archaeologist Christos Tsuntas, who in 1897 co-authored with the American ancient historian Irving Mennet the first synthetic account on the Mycenaean civilization under the title the Mycenaean Age, a work still readable today. In this work, Suntas also discussed, amongst others, the relationship between Mycenaean Greece and the Homeric world, <coughs> distancing, him, distancing himself from Schliemann's rather naive devotion to Homer, and seeing instead the possibility that Homer's narrative may have origins in the Mycenaean period, while also acknowledging that other elements may stem from the time of the formation of the epics by Homer. While at the end of the 19th century, the Mycenaean civilization that represented the heroic age of the ancient Greeks had already become a familiar field of scholarly inquiry, the contemporary culture that flourished in Asia Minor during the late Bronze Age, that of the Hittites, had been almost completely forgotten already in classical antiquity, due to the dramatic cultural breaks that the regions, region underwent in the late second and early first millennia BC. The Hittim were only mentioned in certain passages of the Old Testament. And when the French traveler Charles Texier 
reported in his monumental work, Description de la Vie Mineure, in 1839, on the imposing ruins of an important city with fortifications, temples, and a rock sanctuary with large reliefs that he had discovered near the village of Bogasfei in Central Asia Minor, he had no idea that he had located the remains of Hattusha, the capital of the Hittite Empire, which had been formed a Bronze Age world power. <coughs> it is thought that the ruins belonged to Pteria, a city near which in uh, 547 BC the Lydian king Croesus and the Persian king Cyrus fought against each other in a battle that led to the demise of the Lydian kingdom. The foundations for the rediscovery of the Hittites were led in the 1880s by William Wright, of whom I could not find a photograph, and Archibald Henry Safe, upper left, two British clerics and Orientalists. While studying the Old Testament, they came across indications suggesting that the Hittites were once an important power in Asia Minor, arguing that the Hittites were to be identified with a people named Hatti by the Assyrians and Heta by the Egyptians. The latter had been on hostile terms with the Heta on several occasions, culminating in 1274 BC in the Battle of Kadesh in Syria. And here you see scenes of this battle from the rock temple of Ramses II in Abu Dhabi. For their thesis, Wright and Sayes were initially were vehemently criticized by the scholarly community, but were soon to be proven correct by a spectacular discovery in Egypt. In 1887, excavations in Amarna, on the left of view of the remains of the city, next to the Nile, which became the capital of Egypt under Amenophis IV, Ethnaton, whom you see on the right, brought to light the royal archives, including the correspondence of foreign affairs of the pharaoh. The cuneiform tablets had been written in Akkadian, the diplomatic language of the Near East, which for some time now had already been deciphered. The correspondence comprised, amongst other, letter to the pharaoh by Hittite kings. In one of these letters, a Hittite ruler, which the much resonant name Shupiluluma, congratulated the pharaoh upon accession to the throne. Later, when travelers at the ruins near Bogaskoy found fragments of inscribed clay tablets, there was, one, there was nothing more to hold the interest of the scholarly community. Now the motto read, Nach Bogaskoy, to Bogaskoy, as was the title of an article by the Assyriologist Hugo Winkler, from Berlin, who became the first excavator of Hattusha, you see him on the left. He excavated there between 1906 and 1912. In the archives, Winkler's team found about 11,000 tablets, both intact and fragments thereof, the majority of which were written in an unknown language, several, however, in Akkadian. And in one of the tablets written in Akkadian, which you see on the left, Winkler, discovered a peace treaty between the Hittite great king Hattushili III and Pharaoh Ramses II, which is also recorded in hieroglyphic script on the wall of the temple at Karnak in Egyptian theme on the right. There now remained no more doubt that those archives belonged to the Hittite rulers and that the ruins near Bogaskoy were those of Hattusha, the capital of the Hittite Empire. In 1915, the Czech, uh, Bed Czech scholar Bedrick Rothsny, Rothsny, which you see him on the left, professor for Semitic languages at the University of Vienna, managed to decipher the Hittite cuneiform script. In the course of the First World War, the clay tablets from Hattusha were still being kept in Berlin in the form of a loan until their final edition and publication. Actually, they returned only a few years ago to Turkey. The group of scholars working on the tablets in Berlin included the young Swiss Assyriologist Emil Porra, whom you see on the right. As he later wrote, his basic, basic expectation was, and I quote, that these westernmost uniform texts would enlighten the ethnology of the Near East and, furthermore, Europe, and build a bridge that might lead from the Babylonian civilization to European prehistory. End of quote. He similarly commented that, I quote, it is extremely 
powerful weather, I would be in the position to endure the examination of all 10,000 temples <coughs> if I had not been stirred by the unspoken hope to hear for once something about Troy and Pride. On the 3rd of January 1924, Forer gave a lecture at the Near Eastern and Egyptian Society at Berlin with the title Pre-Homeric Greeks in the Cuneiform Text from Bogaspel, which he published in the same year in the Mitteilungen der Deutschen Orientgesellschaft, the reports of the German Oriental Society. According to Sora, the country named Achigama in the Hittite text of the 14th and 13th century BC, a sea power acknowledged by the Hittites as great kingdom of equal rank, was to be located on the Greek mainland. Uh, the name Achiyama corresponded to the Achaioi, the Achaeans of Homer in the Iliad, one of the three names for the Greeks fighting against Troy. In Forer's opinion, the great kingdom of Achiyama comprised the Greek mainland, the Aegean islands, as well as part of the coast of Asia Minor. Here you see his map of Achiyama, and in Hittite, Taroisha, he recognized Troy, uh, in Lasba, the island of Lesbos. Uh, moreover, he believed that there were names known from the Greek myths in Hittite forms. Tawagalawa, Eteocles, Atarasia, Atreus, and Andavara, Andreus. Forrest's thesis was initially well received. Ulrich Winkel, Ulrich Wilken, sorry, for example, writing in 1924, expressed the opinion in his Griechische Geschichte, Greek history, that, I quote, a new light appears to shine over the Greek heroic age. While Heinrich Schmidt in his Vorgeschichte Europas, prehistory of Europe, in the same year noted that, I quote, from now on we may welcome the heroes of Homer as historical personality. Soon, however, Greeks, uh, soon, however, for us, Greek hypothesis, as dubbed by his academic opponents, was exorigated by other exponents of the emerging discipline of Hittitology, particularly the established Indo-Germanic linguist Ferdinand Sommer. In his weighty work under the title The Achiyava Urkunden, The Achiyava Documents, published in 1932 in later writings, <coughs> Sommer condemned Forer with such vehemence that the latter, despite his great contribution to the identification of the different languages of the cuneiform tablets of Hattusha and later also the Luvian hieroglyphic, was left with no chance of an academic career in Germany. Sommer considered Achiyava to be a land in Asia Minor that he placed in the region of Cilicia. In his academic quarrel with Forer, Sommer had claimed in 1934 that, I quote, the Achiyaba people must prove on the basis of facts other than a similar sounding name that there are indeed Achids. These facts were introduced in the debate in 1935 by the Austrian ancient historian Fritz Schachermeyer in his book Hittita und Achea, Hittites and Achaeans. According to the Hittite text, Achiyaba was a maritime power situated on the coast. The activities associated with Achiyama, as described in these documents, took place in the 14th to 13th century BC, in the same period and in the same region as the archaeologically attested activities of the Mycenaeans. As Schachermeyer attempted to demonstrate with this map, the spheres of interest of the Mycenaeans, marked here by vertical hatching, and the Hittites, marked here with horizontal hatching, overlap in the southwest and south coast of Asia Minor, on Cyprus and on the Levantine coast. Schachermeyer came to the conclusion that Achiyava is unlikely to have been located in Asia Minor, but instead, as far as I believe, should be sought for in Greece. And some of, for his part, also attacked Schachermeyer, but allowed in his last contribution to the topic under the title Achiyava und kein Ende, Achiyava and no end, in 1937, 
that the whole discussion had come to a dead end and proposed to suspend any further comments and quote, I quote, to await if the future might bring forward evidence of a better or different kind either in the direction of Asia Minor Achaeans or European great power. Just before Schachermeyer wrote his book, the great Swedish scholar Martin Nilsson published two works that are of particular importance for the problem of the possible roots of the Trojan myth in the Bronze Age. The Mycenaean origin of Greek mythology in 1932 and Homer and Mycenae in 1933. Together with Fora and Schachermeyer, he belonged to those few scholars of his time that were of the opinion that the Mycenaeans were already speakers of the Greek language. In the Mycenaean origins of Greek mythology, Nielsen studied the geographic aspects of Greek mythology and was able to prove that the places of the myth, especially those of the central mythological cycles, were with no exception the same as the ones that were now known archaeologically to have been important late Bronze Age centers. In those cases for which archaeological evidence during his time was still relatively sparse, he was proven correct by later discoveries. For instance, the uh, importance of the Thebes in uh, Beosha here, with, a, with its important mythological cycles as a Mycenaean palatial center, was made apparent only in the 1960s. I will come back to this later in my talk. And similarly, the palace of Pylos and Messenia, the seat of mythic Nestor, one of the Greek leaders in the ex expedition against Troy, was discovered only in 1939 and uh, is situated here, and was excavated in the 1950s and 60s by Charles Blake. And finally, Yolkos in Thessaly, here, Uh, which is related to the Argonautic cycle, has been identified not long ago with a newly excavated Mycenaean urban center with a palace and royal solos tomb next to the long known Neolithic settlement at Dimini near Wallos. Here's the Neolithic settlement and here the palace, which you see here again, and here one of the uh, uh, solos tombs. Nielsen was also able to demonstrate that the memory of the Great Bronze Age Center survived the so-called Dark Age between the demise of the Mycenaean palaces and the time of Homer, and that the stories recounted in the epics reflect indeed the Mycenaean period. In Homer and Mycenae, Nielsen extended his theory over, the, over, over to the Trojan cycle in order to show that without any doubt the Iliad continued reminiscences of the Mycenaean period, such as the weapons and other objects already mentioned above, the absence of any mention of the Dorians, the existence of large territorial domains as existed in the Mycenaean period, but not during Homer's time, and especially the riches of Mycenae, which by the time of Homer was a small rural town within the old Cyclopean walls. Next to these, however, Nielsen also identified later elements, for example, the appearance of the Phoenicians as seamen and merchants, iron weapons, and cremation burials. He concluded that the Homeric epics entailed elements from different periods spanning at least half a century from the Mycenaean age to the time of Homer. Nielsen accepted the thesis proposed by Fora that the Achiyama mentioned in the Hittite documents should be identified with Homer's Achaeans, that they had their center on the Greek mainland and that their control stretched to the Aegean islands and to the coast of Asia Minor. This was nevertheless a thesis accepted only by a minority. Sommer's last statement, in which he pleaded for patience until new evidence for the solution to the Achaeava problem would become available, was ignored by the majority of linguists and historians, above all, in the German-speaking scholarly world, in which Horror thesis was completely rejected. The decipherment of the linear, Mycenaean Linear B script uh, on the clay tablets discovered from Mycenaean palaces and the identification of the language they document as an early Greek idiom in 1952 
By the British scholar Michael Ventris confirmed, however, the views of Thora, Nielsen, and Schachermeyer that the Mycenaeans had already spoken Greek. In addition, it became evident that Sommer's re reject rejection of the Greek identifications proposed by Thora for the personal names mentioned in the Hittite documents was also mistaken. There are two certain personal names of Ahiyava individuals. Firstly, the name Tavagala, Tavagalava, who was the brother of a king of Ahiyava, documented in the so-called Tavagalava letter. And secondly, the name Atarasia, a man of Ahia, an older form of the name Ahiyava, which is recorded in the so-called indictment of Madhubata. Fora interpreted Tavagalava as a Hittite, Hittite form of the Greek name Eteocles via a presumed older form Eteocles, produced after the discard of the initial vo vocal, an association which Fora, uh, which Soma rejected. Fora's presumed older form, however, was confirmed by the patronym Etevokerevio, Etevokerevios, son of Etevokleves, which appears twice on a clay tablet from Pyrus. Fora associated Atarasia with the Greek name Atreus, a proposal that was again sternly discarded discarded by Sommer. And in a recent work, however, the predominant Oxford classical scholar Martin West has argued that Atreus represents a younger short form of an older Mycenaean name, which may be variously reconstructed as Atresias, Atersias, or Atarsias, and can be brought into its association with Atarasia. And it was not for us but the Vienna Indo-European linguist Paul Kretschmer, who in 1924 associated the name of Alexandru, belonging to a ruler of the land Vilusa, with which the Hittite great king Muratali made a vassal treaty in the early 13th century BC, with a Greek name Alexandros, which in the Iliad represents the alternative name of Prince Paris of Troy. So much re re rejection of this association was based on the premise that the name ending in Andros was impossible before the end of the Mycenaean period. This claim, however, was refuted when the feminine counterpart of Alexandros, Are Karasadara, Alexandra, was read on a linear B tablet from Mycenae. In 1983, the renowned Hittitologist Hans Gustav Hüterbock rehabilitated Fora and gave new impetus to the debate about Ahiyava. Common sense, as Utabok put it, suggests that the Hittites and the Mycenaeans must have known each other. Regarding the location of the land Ahiyava in Asia Minor, he could not find any indication. According to the Hittite text, Ahiyava lay beyond the sea, most probably that of the Aegean, and should therefore be placed in Greece. The Hittite text record a series of events in Western Asia Minor. The exact positioning of these events, however, has been for long an impossible task since the geographical names associated with them, for example, Luca, Vinawanda, Artava, and Vilusa, have been incessantly pushed back and forth by scholars like chess pieces. The result has been a pro proliferation of maps of the political geography of late Bronze Asia, Western, uh, late Bronze Age, West, Western Asia Minor. In fact, there are as many maps as scholars who have spent time on the problem. You can see only two examples. This led in 1977 the British Near Eastern archaeologist James Mellar to speak, I quote, of the guessing game known as Hittite geography. A game which, nevertheless, Mellor himself engaged in very actively. <laughs> New epigraphic discoveries in the 1980s and 90s as well, as a successful reading of a long known but until then undeciphered inscription, have, however, made possible the clarification of the political geography of late Rome Age Asia Minor. The contract between great king Tutalia IV circa 1240 to 1215 BC, and his cousin Corunta, 
king of the secondogeniture of Tarhan Tassa. On the, on the bronze the tablet discovered in 1986 in Hattusha records the borders of Tarhan Tassa. And the border to the west was the river Kastaraya, which the city Parka identified with the river Kestros and the city Pergi, respectively, on the Acropolis of which of Pergi, uh, there has recently been found evidence for Bronze Age settlement. To the west of these lay enemy foreign land. As suggested by the hieroglyphic Luvian inscription from the water basin of Yalbur, Perconia, which was published in 1993, this foreign enemy land was Luca. The inscription recounts a campaign by Tutalia I, fourth, against Luca, and the names of the cities mentioned the text have been identified as those of later Lycian city names. So uh, here uh, we see Via Rwanda, which is Point Rwanda, uh, Palava, which is close, Pinale, which is Pinara, Avarna, Arina, better known as Xanto in Greek, and Atar. <coughs> Accordingly, Luca lay in the later region of Lycia. In 1997, the London the Hittitologist David Hawkins succeeded in reading the hieroglyphic Luvian inscription on the long known rock release A of the Carabelle's hut in the smaller mountain here. And he is David Hawkins. Uh, Hawkins identified as the author of the text King Tarkashnava of Mira, namely the land which annexed Ardava as a new Hittite client state following the latter defeat by the Hittites' great king, Moshili II, about 1350 BC. The Carabella relief must certainly mark the border, the northern border of Arzava Mira. And to the south, Arzava Mira extended to the Dakmos Mountains, as suggested by the rock inscription found here, uh, and uh, here Suratkaya, the rock of Suratkaya, bearing the names of Mira and of the great prince Pantacorota of Mira, discovered by Annalisa Peshlo on the rock of Suratkai. In addition to the borders of Mira and Zava just mentioned, the long proposed identification of Atasa, the capital of Arzava, with Ephesus, is supported by other evidence. The new excavations on the hill of Ayasuluk, here in front you see the Artemision, here the hill of Ayasuluk, uh, are bringing to light an important fortified site of the late Bronze Age, here the Bronze Age wall, and here in a plan, uh, which should be seen as the seat of the king of Arnava Mira. The clay tablet with the cuneiform letter by King Tarun Taradu of Arnava to the pharaoh Amenophis III, found in Amarna in Egypt, was examined by the Israeli scholar Yuval Gord with Newton activation analysis showing that the fabric originates from the region of Ephesus. Milavanda, on the basis of its geographic connections to, firstly Luca and secondly Arzava, as is tested in the Hittite document, should be placed accordingly in the coastal region between Luca in the south and Arzava in the north. Luca in the south and Arzava in the north. This placement made the proposal first put forward in 1929 by the decipherer of Hittite uniform, Bedrich Rotsny, that Milavanda should be identified with the Ionian Miletus even more probable. Later on I will elaborate on the archaeological discoveries from our recent excavations in Miletus which support this identification. And to the north of Arzava Mira, there followed a group of three lands on the coast, which on the basis of associations and interconnections in the Hittite sources should be identified as follows. The Seha River land uh, should be identified with the valleys of the Hermos, which you see here, and the Kaikos, while Laspar, as already suggested by Tora, is the island of Lesbos, and Yusa should be placed in the Torahs. Regarding to the geographical locations of Ayava as, Ayava as early as 1940, Albrecht Götze had demonstrated that Silesia, sorry, that Silesia here, <coughs> where, uh, where 
Tomar uh, placed Ahiyawa was actually the country known as Kizuwatna in the Hittite imperial period. Given the series of countries situated on the south and west coast of Asia Minor, starting from Kizuwatna to Vilusa, this leaves no more space to accommodate Ahiyawa in Asia Minor. As Shachamayel had already noted in 1935, for the Hittites, Ahiyawa was a distant and largely unknown territory, which demanded some form of declaration of interstate law as practiced, as practiced by the Hittites. In contrast to the other territories mentioned in association with the conflict in Western Asia Minor, and also located there, Luka, Milawanda, Arzawa, Zerivale, and Vilusa, the Hittite texts never mention Ahiyawa as a place where the Hittite great king organized an expedition. Ahiyawa is several times mentioned in the context of supporting enemies of the Hittites in West Asia Minor and harboring those fleeing from Hittite control overseas. In a paper published in 1998, I assembled and discussed systematically the various theories proposed over the past decades by those both in favor on the left and against, on the right, for us, Achaean theory. For the identification of Ahiyawa extended, extending from Greece in the west to Cyprus and Cilicia in the east, and from Crete in the south to Thrace in the north. And through a process of elimination, I came to the conclusion that Ahiyawa must have lain on the Greek mainland. But where about? On the Greek lane, mainland should not search for the center of Ahiyawa. Most scholars, in the beginning me included, have assumed this center to be Mycenaean. Sigrid Gea Jalkotzi has, however, rightly brought to my attention the fact that the place named Achaia, place name Achaia, was originally native of central Greece and was later only transferred to the Peloponnese. And in central Greece lies under the modern city of Thebes of the Cadmea, the Mycenaean center with the palace already mentioned, which due to the modern building activities could be excavated, unfortunately only to a very limited and fragmentary extent. The exceptionally rich finds, or frescoes, ivory carvings, gold jewelry, as well as other ornaments of agate and lapis lazuli, to mention but a few, and the archives of linear meat tablets suggest that this must have been a palatial center of no lesser importance than Mycenaean. This significance is also implied by the prosperity associated with it as well as by the important mythological cycle. Carl Blegen, the distinguished American archaeologist who is the excavator of Troy and Pylos, attributed so great an importance to the Thebes, considering it to have been a rival of Mycenae and the hegemonic control over Greece. In interpreting a group of 34 cylinder lapis lazuli seals from the Near East that were discovered in the so called treasury of the palace in Thebes, the American orientalist Edith Porada concluded that they represented a minor worth batch of lapis lazuli sent to the king of Ahiyawa by the Assyrian king to Kulti Ninurta I. According to Porada, the Assyrian king intended to secure support by the king of Thebes against the Hittites, who had set up a blockade on the Levantine coast to the detriment of Assyria. And on the in, in the context of this blockade, the so-called Shaushgamuva Treaty mentions ships from Ahiyawa, which King Shaushgamuva of Amur, South Syria, should not permit to land. On the right, we see a map showing the fine spots of Mycenaean period in the Eastern Mediterranean, which accounts for trade contact with the Syrian coast. The Basel Homer specialist, Joachim Latach, has brought forward further arguments in favor of the identification of Thebes as the capital of Ahiyawa. He considers that such an identification provided a solution to the old riddle why in the ship's catalog in the second book of the Iliad, which lists the Greek forces, begins with Boeotia and why the fleet of the Greeks assembled, assembled in Aulis, the harbor of uh, Thebes, in order to sail against Troy. Of importance for our purpose here is also an Egyptian source, namely the inscription on a statue 
days, and the mortuary temple of Amenophis III, 1397, 887 to 1358, 49 BC, in Egyptian Thebes. This records a list of 17 Aegean place names. The names of the countries and cities are in Egyptian style related to images of prisoners in chains. On the front side, to the right of the central area, which is taken here by the cartouche of the pharaoh, appear two names here, Kaftu and Tanayu, which function more or less as headings. Kaftu is Crete, while Tanayu is part of the Greek mainland. Is and is reminiscent of the Dana Oi, which, apart from the Athens, was a further name used to denote the Greeks fighting against Troy. The remaining 13 names, the last two ones are missing, were carved from the central le left breast and on the entire left side, and they probably represent the itinerary of a diplomatic mission ordered by Amenophis III. The following places can be with, uh, identified with certainty. In Crete, number one, Amnisos, the port of Knossos. Number two, Phaistos. Number three, Hidonia Chania. In the Polis, the Peloponnese, number four, Mycenae. Number six, Messenia. Then eight, the uh, island of Kifira. And once more in Crete, number ten, Knossos. Uh, number 11, again Amnisos, and number 12 here, Lyptos. This suggests that the embassy arrived from Egypt first to Crete, landed then on the Peloponnese, reaching finally via Kifira once more Crete, and returning back to Egypt. In Mycenae, this embassy left behind an impressive gift. A group of faience plaques found in Mycenae carry the name of the pharaoh Amenophis III. Such plaques were used as revetments for door gems in Egyptian palaces. In addition to the plaques, the occurrence of rosettes made of faience, similar to those discovered in Egyptian palaces, has led the German Egyptologist Wolfgang Kell to conclude that Amenophis III had presented the ruler of Mycenae with an Egyptian chamber that was installed within the temple. <coughs> Two names appearing in the list of the Aegean place names have given rise to much controversy. Here, number five, Dikagayas, and number nine, Vajurliya. Dikagayas was identified by the German Egyptologist Elmar Eder, who made the first publication of the list, and the Czech Linear B specialist, Antonin Bartomek, with Thebes. If this is correct, Dikagayas appears as the only place name of the country of Tanaya that lies outside the Peloponnese. Other scholars have opted for a location of Dikagayas in the Peloponnese, in Tegea or Tegea, where Mycenaean remains have recently been brought to light. For Vajuralia, Edel and other scholars had proposed an identification with Vilusa, Troy. However, others consider this unlikely given that the name occurs on the list between numbers 8 and 10, Kifira and Knossos, respectively, making thus Troy an extreme outlier in the itinerary proposed and suggesting that the place is more likely to be found on Crete. The combined Hittite and Egyptian sources allow, in my opinion, two interpretative possibilities. First, if Dikagayas is indeed Thebes and belonged to the country that the Egyptians called Tanayu, the land of the Danaoi, then there existed one Mycenaean kingdom which encompassed the Peloponnese and central Greece, and which the Hittites referred to with the name Achiyaba, the land of the Achaeans. Second, if the Kagaya is not Thebes, but a place in the Peloponnese, there existed two great Mycenaean kingdoms. The first was Tanayu, the land of the Danaoi, in the Peloponnese, with its center at Mycenae and had contacts at, uh, with Egypt. And the second was Achiyama, the land of the Achaeans, with its center at Thebes, and its external relations were focused more on Asia Minor and the Near East. Regardless of whether the center of Achiyama was in Mycenae or Thebes, the identification of this country name as belonging to the Greek mainland confirms to the 
picture gained from our recent excavation of the Bronze Age levels at Miletus, supported by the Institute for Aegean Prehistory, which can be securely identified with the Achillaren foothold Milabanda of the Hittite sources. During the occupation periods, Miletus 5, here in orange, on the plan, and 6, red, corresponding to the 14th and 13th centuries BC, Miletus emerges in terms of material culture as a purely Mycenaean settlement, irrespective of how large a group of the resident population actually came from Greece or were natives of Asia Minor that had adopted completely Mycenaean culture. Material remains demonstrating the Mycenaean character include house architecture. Here on the left you see a plan of the remains of a corridor house of Mycenaean type. The pottery is almost completely Mycenaean in appearance, and of particular note here is the locally produced undecorated household ware, examples here shown on the left, rather than the decorated imported wares, examples shown on the right. Graffiti of linear B sites inside on storage vessels before the firing, as well as a Mycenaean seal stone, suggest the presence of the Mycenaean system of administration while Mycenaean cult and burial rites are suggested by the discovery of a temple with a clay altar below. Uh, um, while Mycenaean cult and, uh, sorry, uh, with female and, bull, uh, female and bull, they are hotter figurines, as well as the extent existence of the already mentioned chamber tombs of Mycenaean time. Similar finds at other places, like here at Yasos uh, at Musgebi, and recently also at Halikanathos, the boardroom, suggest that the country of Milawanda stretched from Miletus to the peninsula of the Halikanathos boardroom in the south. The chain of islands from Samos in the north to Rhodes in the south that had furnished Mycenaean times must represent the places repeatedly mentioned in the Hittite text that lay under the control of the king of Ahiyama and that functioned a safe retreat for the enemies of the Hittites. Further to the north, the number of finds of Mycenaean ceramic and other imports, both on the west coast of Asia Minor as well on the, as on the nearby islands, is smaller and were found in settlements and cemeteries that demonstrate a predominantly local character. Accordingly, in these areas that coincide with the Lubin countries of Ardava Mira, the Zephyr Riverland, and Belusa, lived only smaller groups of Mycenaean Greeks, traders, potters, and other craftsmen, amongst the majority of native lubyan speaking populations. For many centuries, Western Asia Minor lay within a tension zone between Achillava and the Hittite Empire, with the former presenting constant problems to the latter by way of its allies on the West Coast. The oldest reference to Achillava in the older form known as Achia is found in the already mentioned indictment of Maduwata, a letter addressed by King Arnuvanda I, circa 1400 to 1375 BC, to Maduwata, a disloyal vassal of the Hittite state in West Asia Minor, in which the aforementioned king complained about the misdeeds of Maduwata during the time of Arnuvanda's father, Tutalia I, who founded the Neo-Hittite Empire. In particular, Maduwata seems to have shown defective military confidence on a number of occasions. First, he suffered a merciless defeat in the course of an attack against uh, Arlava, with the latter occupying Maduwata's territory, and had to resort to the invention of a Hittite army to regain its control. It was then attacked by Atarasia, the men of Achia, to which Maduwata did not pose any resistance, but instead fled, and once more, the Hittites had to intervene. Atarasia's <laughs> army, which included 100 battle chariots, a reconstruction of the Mycenaean chariot <coughs> shown on the right, was finally crashed by a Hittite force. The use of these 100 chariots suggests that Atarasia did not operate from ships, but from a Mycenaean settlement to the south on the west coast of Asia Minor. His base is likely to have been Milawanda Miletus, uh, where the archaeological evidence for Mycenaean presence reaches back as the 15th century BC. 
As we learn from his own annals, Tutvalia the first launched a successful military campaign against the territories belonging to Arzava, amongst which Arzava itself and the Deha River then. And from the Vankish areas carried back to Hatusha numerous captives and chariots. And on the way, he was ambushed by a force assembled from at least 20 countries named one by one, including Lilusa, which in the specialist literature is often referred to as the Asuva Coalition. This, however, most probably included member states like regions of the country Asuva, which is to be placed far in the Northwest Asia Minor. Tutalia crashed the Asuva and returned with captives, including members of the royal family and booty back to Hatusha. Afterwards, the name Asuva disappears from the Hittite text and is replaced by Wilusa. There are indications that Ahiyawa became involved in the Asuba conflict. As the Tübingen Hittitologist Frank Stark has shown recently, the cuneiform document shown here is the letter by the king of Ahiyawa to the Hittite king, uh, great king Hattushili III, circa 1265 to 1240 BC. The first 11 lines record the dispute between the king of Ahiyawa and that of Hattusha over the islands which once belonged to Asuba but have been given as a dowry to an ancestor of the addressee by the king of Asuba, who had married his daughter. Since Asuba had ceased to exist following the submission by the Tyler the I in the late 15th century BC, the islands must have been acquired by the king of Ahiyawa in the course of the 15th century BC, and most probably included the islands in the north Aegean near the Troas, as for instance Lim, uh, Limnos and Imbros, where both uh, remains of late Bronze Age occupation with Mycenaean pottery have recently come to light. <coughs> the dynastic marriage recorded here suggests furthermore the existence of close contact between Asuba and Ahiyawa. And two finds dating to the late 14th century BC from Hattusha are particularly interesting in this context as they appear to reflect hostile activities in Asia Minor by Mycenaeans. A fragment of a Hittite boat on the left shows the inside figure of a warrior whose military equipment and most visibly his zoned helmet with bushy horsehair on its crest is not Hittite. As shown by Kurt Bittel, the longtime excavator of Hattusha, the warrior's helmet is of Mycenaean type. We have thus in front of us a Hittite representation of a Mycenaean warrior of the time of Atarasia and Tutalia I. And the second find is a bronze age sword on the right that bears a votive inscription in Akkadian, and the inscription reads, Tutalia, the great king, having destroyed Milan Asuba, dedicated the swords to the weather god, his master. It is clear that the sword was part of the booty taken by Tutraya I in the course of the Asuba War. The sword is Mycenaean and belonging to the so-called B-time. It is possible that warriors from Ahiyawa fought on the side of Asuba against the Hittites. During the reign of Tutraya III, circa 1375 to 55 BC, the Kashka, enemies of the Hittites, settled here in the Pontic region, captured Hattusha, the capital of uh, here, the capital of the Hittite Empire, and extended areas of the Hittite land. Taking advantage of the weakened position of the Hittite Empire, Arzawa launched another attack from the west and conquered the lower land. The Hittite Empire was facing imminent collapse while Azawa was emerging as a new leading power in Asia Minor. The Egyptian pharaoh Amenophis III sought to form an alliance with Arzawa and pursued a dynastic marriage with the daughter, with the daughter of King Tahmurabu of Arzawa, which actually is likely to have taken place. And a passage in the preserved letter by Amenophis III reads, I quote, I have heard that all has come to an end, and that the land Hatti has been dashed to pieces." End of quote. This was, however, not the case. Tutalia III 
sent his son Tupiluliuman against Arzawa, who managed to achieve an illustrious victory and to expel the troops of Arzawa from the lower land. Tupiluliuman, then, in his role as great king, was able to destroy the kingdom of the Mitanni in the east and to render Hatti to the most powerful state in the Near East. Not long after these developments, Hatti experienced <coughs> another crisis. Around 1318 BC, King Arnuvanna II died after a brief term of office, and upon accession to the throne, his younger brother, Moshidi II, was confronted immediately with attacks from all sides, as the enemies of Hatti believed that they could capitalize on the inexperience of the young ruler. In the West, this led to the formation of an alliance against the Hatti, which included Arzawa, Ahiyama, and Minawanda, as made evident by a passage in the annals of Moshili III, which you see on the right. The great king sent troops to the west against Milawanda and succeeded to capture and destroy it. And we had found this destruction. On the basis of the recovered pottery, period five, five, sorry, period five of the settlement near the temple of Athena in Miletus ends around this time with a fire destruction. Uh, which was most probably caused by the invading troops of Moshili II. In the same year as the destructions of Milawanda, Moshili II himself led an army against Arzawa and marched into Abhaza Ephesus. King Fuhat city of Arzawa fled overseas to the islands, as stated in the annals of Moshili, which most reasonably means the island belonging to Ahiyawa, such as Samos, Kos, and Rhodes. In the following year, Moshili devastated the last enclaves of resistance in Ardava, subdued Mira, and the Leha River land, and installed client kings in both states. As already mentioned, Ardava was assigned to the control of Mira. Milusa had abstained from taking part in this conflict. In the preamble of the Alexander Treaty already mentioned, and to which I will come soon again, it is stated that, I quote, when Trutalia marched against Ardava, he did not enter Vilusa. The latter preserved peace and sent an embassy, end of quote. For the remaining terms of office of Moshili II, that ended circa 1290 BC, the Hittites enjoyed a period of tranquility in West Asia Minor. After its capture by Hittite troops, Milawanda Mailitus returned to the control of Ahiyama during the reign of Muvatali II, circa 1290 to 72 BC, who was the son and successor of Moshi II. This is suggested by a letter sent by Manabata Hunta, <coughs> king of the river, uh, king of the river Zehaland, to Muvatali II. The restoration of Milawanda is likely to have taken place as part of a deal through which the Hittites, in the light of their confrontation with Egypt that culminated in the Battle of Kalish in 1274 BC, attempted to secure the cooperation of the king of Ahiyama in maintaining stability in Western Asia Minor by gratifying his territorial ambitions in the region. But Ahiyama, through its client state of Milawanda Miletus, continued to provide causes for further unrest in Western Asia Minor. Already in the reign of Muvatali II, a certain Piya Maradu, who remained for decades one of the most daring enemies of the Hatti in West Asia Minor, and was active from Bilusa in the north to Luka in the south, and had his base at, at Milawanda. As evident from the letter of Manapato Hunter mentioned earlier, Piya Maradu had <coughs> occupied Bilusa, Troy, at the start of the reign of Muvatali II. Manapata Hunta intervened by launching a military attack on Piyamaradu, but apparently suffered a great, uh, grave defeat. Piyamaradu then attacked Laspa, the island of Lesbos, and before the arrival of the Hittite army that had been, had been called to help, carried off with him a series of Sarapitu, priestly personnel at the service of the Hittite king and the king of the real, uh, river Zehalen, to Milawanda, where Atpa, who was the father-in-law of Pia Maradu, was a vassal of the king of Ahiyama. After the expulsion of Pia Maradu from Melusa, <coughs> who 
Vitali II and Alexander of Belusa entered a mutual treaty that guaranteed protection for Belusa, but also prescribed obligatory contributions to the Hittite master of truth. In his report on the Battle of Kadesh, Ramses II indeed mentions among the auxiliary troops fighting for the Hittite warriors, uh, fighting for the Hittite, he mentions warriors from Dardania. The name can be undoubtedly associated with the Dardanoi, a name also used for the Trojans in the Iliad, and moreover, the source for the place named Dardanelles. How did, uh, now, at the end of the treaty, the gods of Hatti and Belusa are summoned as witnesses. Interestingly, one of the names appearing among the gods of Belusa is Apalyunas. Fora identified Apalyunas as Apollo via an older form Apelion that he reconstructed on the basis of Cypriot Apelon and Doric Apelon. Sommer, of course, rejected the proposed association, but Güterborg considered it probable. It should be remembered here that in the Iliad, Apollon appears as the protector of Troy, while his origins are frequently considered to be outside of Greece. Information about Higamarabu's later activities in Western Asia Minor can be gleaned primarily, primarily from the so-called Tavalagawa letter addressed by Hattushili III, circa 1265 to 40 BC, which is depicted on the right in a rock relief at Fraktin, to the king of Ahiyama. In this letter, from which only the third tablet has been preserved, Hattushili complains about Figamarabu's hostile actions and the shelter offered to him by the king of Ahiyama. The base of Tawaragawa's Eteocles operations, who appears in the letter and who was a brother of the king of Ahiyama and his representative in West Asia, Asia Minor, seems to have been in Vilawanda Miletus. When Hattushili marched west with his army, Pia Marabu pretended to be willing to surrender, but instead ambushed the Hittites near Iyalanda, the place in later times known as Alinda. Yes. The Hittites, however, managed to defeat Pia Marabu, who escaped to Vilawanda Miletus. The king of Ahiyama agreed to surrender Pia Marabu, but when Hattushili reached the borders of Vilawanda to collect his prisoner, it turned out that the latter had already escaped overseas to Ahiyama. And the passage in the Tabalagaba letter is of particular interest in relation to Vilusa Troy. This concerns a request made by Hattushili to the king of Ahiyama to re remind the third person that the two kings had agreed to make peace as regards the Vilusa affair, for which they had previously fought each other. The last preserved historical sources on the history of the late Bronze Age in Western Asia Minor, Ahiyama and Vilawanda, are the cuneiform texts of Tutkaya the Fourth, circa 1240 to 15 BC. On the right, a relief showing him from the Rex, at the Red Rock Sanctuary at Yazidikanda, near Katusha. The most important document is the so called Vilawanda, Vilawanda letter. The addressee is a client king in West Asia Minor who, although not mentioned in the part of the letter preserved, is styled by Tutraya as my son. The letter is about a new agreement that has been reached by, by the sender and receiver regarding the borders of Milawanda. Irrespective of whether the receiver was based in Mira or in Milawanda Miletus, as both places have been proposed, more importantly, the Milawanda letter shows a change of power had taken place in Milawanda Miletus, and the influence of Ahiyama was eliminated. Such a change of power is also suggested by the available archaeological evidence. According to the results of our most recent excavations, the fortification wall <coughs> of Miletus VI, constructed in the so-called custom mower box wall technique, and featuring bastions projecting at regular intervals, was built around 1200 BC, namely following the change of power. And these features suggest an Anatolian Hittite rather than Mycenaean type of fortification, which may have looked similar to the city walls of Katusha 
or reconstruction below. Another indication of the same phenomenon is provided by the fragment of a locally produced Mycenaean crater dated to around 100 BC, showing a horned conical object. Without doubt, a conical crown with horns resembling the headgear worn by Hittite gods and also kings. And the bird head, that as you can see here, and the bird's head uh, here in the right edge of the fragment possibly represents a part of a copied uh, hieroglyph, hieroglyphic Luvian inscription. A bird is also to be found in a similar position in the inscription from Caravel A, as mentioned earlier, here in front of the figure of Takashnava. At any rate, the representation of the Hittite god or great king on a Mycenaean crater produced at Miletus is a strong indication of Hittite influence. The main subject of the so-called Milawata letter, however, was not, as the descriptive term adopted by modern scholarship may imply, Milawata, Milawata Milawanda, but rather Vilusa, Troy. Tutraya's aim was to install Valu, a Hittite client king who had been expelled from Vilusa and found refuge in Milawanda, back to the throne in Vilusa. What do the Hittite sources have to say about the subject of so much heated debate in the last decades, namely the possible historic historicity of the ancient literary tradition of the Trojan War? As already discussed, the Hittite documents record several attacks against Vilusa Troy which was a client state of the Hittite Empire, and made clear that Ahiyama and its own vassal Milavanna Miletus were implicated. The Trojan War is not to, be found, not, not to be found mentioned directly in the Hittite sources, which furthermore become particularly intermittent shortly after 1200 BC, prior to the demise of the Hittite Empire. The conflicts recorded in these sources, however, provide a gener ge generic historical picture in which an attack by Mycenaean Greeks leading to the capture and destruction of Troy fits well. In, its context, in this context, it's interesting to note further that, as pointed out by the German Hittitologist Volkert Haas, personal, personal names of Trojans in the Iliad, such as Priam or Paris, which do not have a Greek et etymology, can be traced back to Luvian without difficulty. Although no epic poetry of the Mycenaean period has come down to us, there should be no doubt about its existence in the context of Mycenaean culture with, which is, with its close connection to the Near East and Egypt. The painted battle scenes commissioned by the Mycenaean rulers on the walls of their palaces certainly were intended to celebrate specific victories which were also recounted at the court by singers. Such a singer playing the lyra is shown here on the right, a wall painting from the throne room at the palace in Pilos. Reconstructions of painted battle scenes you see here, here on, the upper, on the left. On the upper left is seen showing the battle over the city from the throne room at Mycenae, and below from an audience hall of the palace of Pilos. The scenes of two parties fighting each other, here below left, uh, one including Mycenaean warriors, wearing, as you can see, uh, Mycenaean boars, cars, helmets, <coughs> and Greeks also. Uh, the other with non Mycenaean fighters, uh, clad in animal hides. The Greek archaeologist Nicolas Yaluris has brought this fresco in association with a passage in the Iliad, Book 733, following, in which Nestor of Pilos summons to memory his heroic deeds in his victory over the Arcadians. The Arcadians were known throughout antiquity to have dressed in sheep hides. According to Yaluris, the fresco commemorated this famous battle that was praised in epic poetry and recounted on all festive, uh, festive occasions across the land, and everyone looking at this painting was reminded of Linguistics have demonstrated that the meter used in the Homeric epic, the hexameter, is of Mycenaean origin, and that a series of verses of the Iliad actually comes from the poetry of the Mycenaean period. In this manner, the stories about the Trojan War were further transmitted across the so-called Dark Age, which at least in some regions of Greece is becoming more illuminated, 
and experience repeatedly changes until they were used by Homer <coughs> as a backdrop to his story of the conflict between Achilleus and Agamemnon, as Joachim Lafarge has shown. The story itself reflects the conflicts and disputes between aspiring aristocracies of the, this time, the second half of the 8th century BC. In the Iliad, Homer exaggerated in a debuting poetic fashion the conflict on Belusa Troy by representing it as an enterprise of Hellenic importance, which included the most famous heroes of Greece that set sail with a fleet of thousand ships to capture Troy. Homer, based on the older tradition, produced a totally new and truly great work, the first great epic poet of the Occident, which forms an important element 